well, well. Happy Friday, everybody. What's going on, E Range? How are you, brother? It's getting cold. I, I'm cold. You see, I'm bundled <laughs> up here, man. Uh, like I'm a, you know, I'm a natural Florida boy. We don't do this cold stuff. Like <laughs> you like hey, wait man. a minute, wait a minute now. <laughs> right, for real. But I see your Christmas tree up in the background, man. That that's one thing I'll say is pretty exciting. Everybody's starting to get into the Christmas holiday spirit. You know, my neighbors are putting up lights and. All of that good stuff. Our tree been up since before Thanksgiving, so you already know how it go here, man. Right, right, right. Hey, listen, you see my look at look behind you. I, I see mean, it back real, in the back. I got a little tree going on. <laughs> <laughs> you, you got your you got your herd did, you got your I got the herd did. do a little something special for, for the Christmas holidays. So listen, everybody. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. Um, happy Kwanzaa. God bless everyone out there. We're so happy to be with you. You're on live with Canada Talk with Roz. And today we're just going to have a really deep conversation, a real insightful conversation. There's a lot of things going on federally that we want to talk about. Um, it's called the MORE Act. And we have some awesome guests coming on today. We actually have one guest. She's flying so fast and so hot. She's going to fly in here and she's going to fly out of here. Um, but um, just to start out with, let me first um, bring our first guest on in. We have Miss Courtney Davis. Hi, Courtney. Hi. How are you? Hey, lovely. <laughs> How are you this morning or this, this afternoon, rather? Yeah, I'm doing fine. I'm a little bit jealous also. The Christmas tree is looking really good in the background. Yeah. Uh, so I, that, that makes me happy. That's right. <laughs> Listen, I was at Cracker Barrels last night. They had a little ornaments, 50% off. I'm thinking ornaments. <laughs> oh, yes, I'm trying to be in the spirit. Um, you know, God bless everyone with the pandemic that's going on. It's still real. Um, so I'm trying to create an environment that, you know, it feels happy, feels good. Um, as we hopefully get out of this mess um, in the very near future. But Courtney, please introduce yourself to everybody and let them know who you are and what you do. And uh, we'll, we'll go from there. Sure. Um, uh, my name is Courtney Davis, and I serve as the Director of Government Relations and Public Affairs for Marijuana Matters, which is a nonprofit um, that's focused on standardizing social equity in the cannabis in the way that it's understood. Um, our vision is to repair what's been dismantled, restore what's been destroyed, and reclaim uh, what's been displaced. We, we believe that um, this is an opportunity to leverage uh, the potential economic opportunity that the legalized cannabis prevents for communities of color. Um, so happy to be here and happy to talk more about our organization and me. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we're um, looking to do the, the good work um, in the cannabis reform space. Well, awesome, awesome, awesome. How long have you been in this space um, doing this? Is your background public policy and, and things of that nature? Yeah, so I started with Marijuana Matters um, earlier this year, but prior to that, I worked on the Hill. I worked for Senator Michael Bennett from Colorado for about, um, oh my gosh, seven, eight years. Um, and I focused on federal policies related to agriculture. Um, veterans uh, and a number of different uh, intersections. And so hemp became something that I started to focus on around 2014 with the Farm Bill. And, um, you know, with Colorado, even though the state had legalized and that really didn't have much to do with my office, I just kind of became really interested in, you know, going beyond freeing the plant and wanting to know what the criminal justice portion of cannabis reform looked like and how I could, you know, have an impact on that. Absolutely. Um, so you guys, we're talking about the more act. So we just gonna get into this deep. Um, you guys, if you're listening to us, share first and foremost, if you got friends, share with your friends. Um, if you have comments, if you have questions, put them in the comment, let us know what your thoughts are. Let be engaged in this conversation. We do have a second guest that's going to join us, and, and her name is Amber Little, uh, Little John. Um, she's the executive director for uh, Minority Cannabis Business Association. Um, she has led the charge, she and her organization, from a federal perspective on this issue. Um, they've done such great work as an organization, have been pushing, pushing, pushing to make sure that social equity and social justice is a priority. Um, and so we are going to have Amber. She's going to probably fly in here hot, Eric and, um, and um, Courtney, because literally we are um there is momentum going on in the on the hill right now so let hold on let me let me just share my screen and let's talk about it a little bit let's talk about this all right guys so now as for 
for all you guys who don't know, the House is set to vote on the historic bill Friday that would decriminalize marijuana. So in, in, in a nutshell, I don't know um, how comfortable you feel, um, um, Courtney. Can you give us an overview about what the what the MORE Act consists of? Sure. Um, the MORE Act consists of a couple of different buckets that I like to call them. Uh, one is descheduling and decriminalization. And so it would remove marijuana from Schedule 1 of the Controlled Substance Act, which is the law that regulates how the government controls drug use and distribution based on the potential for abuse and if there's any risk to public health. So marijuana has been scheduled along with heroin, LSD um, for decades now. And you know, removing this classification would allow um, folks to provide for the opportunity for research. Um, individuals that are in the legal market in their states would have better access to banking. Um, they would be able to get up underneath something called the 280E tax law, which um, does prohibits them from writing off any business related expenses, which is extremely cost prohib prohibitive to get into the industry and, and staying in and being um, profitable. Um, yeah. so, uh, and then also just, you know, not being seen as illegal anymore. Um, the descheduling and decriminalization does not legalize it at the state's level. It, it gives the states the opportunity to regulate the plant as they see fit, but um, it definitely has some good implications for business owners um, and individuals. Awesome. Uh, there's a, yeah, there's a restorative justice portion in it that attempts to address the harms that have been done to communities of color that were most adversely impacted by the war on drugs. So it establishes an opportunity trust fund within the Department of Treasury. Uh, this fund would pay for social services in communities that have been identified as having hardships due to the war on drugs. And so it'll help pay for, uh, the money will go to nonprofits that are providing services and expungement of cannabis convictions, literacy programs, reentry services, and et cetera. Um, the funds would come from a 5% excise tax on all cannabis products that are sold or imported into the United States. So you go to a dispensary and you buy a gummy or you buy a pre-roll or whatever, it's gonna be a 5% federal tax on that. That money will go to the Department of Justice. It'll also go to the Small Business Administration to help um, el eligible states will receive some of that money to develop social equity programs and to also uh, give out lower interest loans to individuals that would be considered social equity recipients. Um, so on the face right. of the bill, on the face of the bill, and I won't tell you, and I e, e probably has just gave me a little heads up that did the bill pass at the house. It's happening right now. Okay. Yeah, 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 about ten minutes before we came on, the uh, the timer clicked to zero uh, for them to be able to implement their vote, and uh, it did pass. Uh, two nineteen, I think, to one seventy two. Okay. Uh, any, any, any Republicans voted for it? Uh, you had okay, so it passed two nineteen to one sixty two. You had five Republicans vote for it. Man, so <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> right. So we didn't think that. So, so again, on the face, on the face, what we're the things that we like. What I like is the two percent. I mean, the five percent from a from a um you know from a trust fund perspective there's so many other there's nuances but there is some 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 detail that maybe folks may miss and 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 I want you Courtney continue your conversation but start going into those some of those nuances that you guys that are with us right now you need to be aware of go for it Courtney okay yeah so the last thing I'll say is that the resentencing and expungements section of the bill um it does uh, expunge federal nonviolent and like low level marijuana convictions. Um, it'll be retroactive from 1971. And then for individuals that are currently incarcerated with federal crimes, um, they'll have an opportunity for resentencing. And so that's something that we support. Um, and back in August of this year, um, we signed on to a letter, um, our organization, along with a number of other social justice and drug um, groups in support of the MORE Act. Um, it's never been a perfect bill sure. or issues that we have with it, but we were supportive of it. 
um, until a couple of days ago. <laughs> Let me stop. Because uh, uh, was, because we were supportive of it. And remember, guys, there was a big kind of a clash between safe banking and the Moore Act, and they were who was get, who was pulling down most oxygen, and which one was which. And we had MSOs who were really supporting safe banking, but not really getting on board with the the Moore Act. And and you know, my thought was like, okay, safe banking. We need black businesses need safe banking, just like the right, exactly, yeah. period. However, the MORE Act covers a more comprehensive opportunities for equity, right? Yes. Right? So not perfect, right? But here's, it here's the conversation. Right, yeah, here's I the question right here. For the past two days that we've been having issues with, go for it, Courtney. <laughs> okay. So, I'm giving you the lead in, girl. I'm giving you the lead in. <laughs> so, I mean, as a, as a person who used to work on the Hill, like, I, I understand tracking things closely until the end. This bill for the longest, um, you know, a, a lot of bills that are kind of controversial like this, uh, they, we've gotten into a point in, on Congress where they're not allowing amendments. There's, they would say, this bill is not going to change. This is exactly how it's gonna be. And so I think a lot of us, after we kind of, you know, negotiated to a certain degree, thought that the MORE Act that was going to be voted on today was gonna to be exactly what we saw. And so it turns out that there was some language that came out in a committee report by House and Ways Committee um, that explicitly stated that the Department of Treasury has the right to reject applications for licenses or permits for individuals, owners, shareholders, et cetera, if they have a cannabis related court proceeding. So this is including anything from an arrest to a probation, a conviction, et cetera. Um, this is extremely problematic for a lot of groups, including Marijuana Matters. Um, and we worked for a couple of, I mean, for 48 hours, 72 hours, we worked to try and get this language removed. Um, but unfortunately the bill was locked. There wasn't anything that we could do about it. Um, but for us, this is in you know direct contrast to states that have already led the way in their social equity programs. Um, most states have a program that welcomes individuals with prior convictions to apply for licenses as a way to encourage participation in the industry from those communities. Um, so I think that this just, again, is going to directly impact African-Americans communities and those individuals that are looking for ways to enter into our already cost prohibitive market. Um, it doesn't automatically reject those applications, but the mere fact that the federal government is there. potentially and the bill is passed and the language is in there, investors will see that and and want to you know, calculate their risk and probably will not be looking to do business with those individuals. And so will the banks. And, and right. the banks will do that same, that, you know, same thing. Those types of words that will, you know, take a bank's risk and elevate it to a point where they will just decide not to not to be involved with the business. So, right. um, you know, uh, I'll you, I'll, 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 let me and I'll tell you this from a statement. Our statement in for MM was very not not even a statement. It was a um, you know a kind of a line in the sand. M for MM is not supporting the Moore Act in its current state. The provision that cuts out those with felonies from pursuing businesses or working in the industry is problematic and is giving us a huge concern. And so that is our issue today. And this is why folks have been fighting, because I don't know if you guys understand, you can get locked out of a bill. You can have a bill that someone at the uh, at the 11th hour put language in and due to some of the parliamentarian um, procedures or what have you, you end up having that bill that either has to go as it is. You can't change it anymore or you have to kill it. And, meaning, and kill it means you basically don't put it on the floor for a committee vote. You basically yank it off the agenda. And that's, to be honest with you, we was like, you know, we've been on the phone, Courtney. I've been with Courtney and shout out to, you know, uh, um, to Supernova Women and Hood Incubator and, um, you know, all the MCBA folks. MCBA has been coming strong. They had all their board on there. Strong, strong coalition just gathering together. And shout out to what you guys were doing. And basically, um, we were like, you know, some of us. So I'm just speaking. But I, I'll speak for <laughs> let me let me time out on that. I'll speak for myself. I was like, <laughs> kill it, you know, because 
it, let's talk about this. It sets up, if you have a bill, it may not go and t- get turned into law. And maybe we right. need to do a, maybe we need to do a, well, a, a you know what, rock, Eric, schoolhouse rock them and tell them what's next. You know, and, and I think, I think that was where I kind of, one, I always knew we, I think we always knew that the more act was going to pass, even if it had stayed in, you know, and two days ago, we didn't get this, you know, midnight hour politics as uh, Peter Tosh would call it. You know what I mean? Even if it got, you know, it stayed that way and it got passed. We, we, we knew there was still an uphill battle because it does have to still go to the Senate. And right now, you know, the Senate is, is, it's a no go for right now. Right. We, we might be able to get something uh, in 2021, depending on how this race in Georgia goes. And so I want to get Courtney's thoughts on that uh, in a little bit as well. But, you know, Courtney, my question to you is, you know, in the House, since the House, I mean, I'm sorry, in the Senate, say, for instance, the Senate goes blue and, and they take the majority and they take this up, this more act in, in the Senate. Is there an opportunity at that point to, uh, I guess, if the, if the Senate were to pass a bill that was similar, but this, you know, disallowed the language that was added in, wouldn't mm-hmm. they have to then go to conference to, to, to compromise to, to some degree? Yeah. I, I'm talking, I'm talking po- real political strategy here. You know? <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, they would go to conference. It wouldn't necessarily be that big of a deal um, because uh, that doesn't seem like too much of a difference that would have to eventually be uh, made whole. But I do think that even if this, even if the two races in Georgia, the two Democrats in Georgia win. I think something that a lot of folks don't talk about is that there are a lot of Democrats that don't necessarily like or feel comfortable with cannabis legalizations, uh, restorative justice. And so, you know, especially a lot of the, you know, sometimes it's the people that are maybe a little bit older you know, have a different level of education that needs to take place in order to bring them to the table. You know, some folks, I mean, I grew up in the dairy generation prior to that, um, you know, reefer madness. So there's a lot of re-education that, oh, hey, Amber. <laughs> <laughs> we shot her in. What's up, Amber? This is so important. We're going to bring Amber, Amber right on in. Go right, ahead. And there's a lot of, you know, re-education that has to take place um, amongst both parties. And the Senate is just a more deliberative body. Um, I think it's still going to be a challenge, even though it's not going, you know, Mitch McConnell's not going to bring it up. I still think that it would be a challenge to get the Senate to just pass the MORE Act without that one paragraph. I don't see that happening. Yeah. Yeah. So you guys, you just saw, we just brought in Ms. Amber um, Littlejohn in. And again, Amber, we have been, um, talking about the Moore Act, um, sharing a little bit. We just found out that it did pass on the on the House side, and, yeah. um, and, and with five Republican votes, which was I thought was quite interesting. Um, you know, we have been Courtney and I, and along with um, your leadership, your organization, MCBA, and, and again, I will be remiss if I did not say that y'all been strong, and I tell you, strong in regards to your board members, um, you know, your policy folks just coming together and bringing the other individuals because this is where you guys really shine and do such an excellent job. So we'll share a little bit about yourself and your role and your thoughts today on, and we've already talked about that we, there, that part of the bill that's problematic that we as an organization, m for mm and as Roz is, is unacceptable. So you got a floor, my friend. Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Amber Littlejohn. Again, excuse my uh, slightly disheveled experience, believe it or, uh, appearance. Believe it or not, this was actually an improvement. Uh, it's been a very rough week. Uh, I have been fighting, scrapping, uh, and and losing a whole lot of sleep trying to again get us our community to the best possible result in the immediate and long term. So, um, yeah, we you know we. We're the coalition again, as Roz mentioned, we are, you know, I'm, I'm here in DC and we, we do a lot of hard work around, around federal policy. And so MCBA's support of the MORE Act has always been extraordinarily qualified. Um, there have been issues with the bill from the, from the outset. Um, it is the bill that had momentum. So despite all of the 
blaring flaws and from the beginning regulate like tobacco, a gigantic flaw. Um, really a lack of focus on economic justice and, um, and was a gigantic flaw. The lack of a regulatory framework, a gigantic flaw. But the bill had momentum and we have the opportunity in this progressive Congress and a Congress that is more progressive than a Congress we are likely to have for a very long time, yes. um, have the opportunity to lay the foundation uh, for social equity. And I will tell you that when I started in this in doing federal policy for MCBA, we were at the point that industry and lawmakers were ready to take off running without us. I'm talking past legislation that had zero mention of social equity that would have been devastated and completely shut us out of any participation. So we've gone from there to being able to pass a highly flawed Frankenstein of a bill on the floor that if you don't look at the inconsistencies um, and the language that again, undermines the spirit and intent, sends a good message in terms of the fact that equity will be a cornerstone of federal cannabis policy. Mm -hmm. And so a little bit of, of how this horrible rotten sausage was made to get us to this vote that we should be celebrating, but now feel some kind of way about. Yes. Um, the bill had really generic language that dealt with the regulate like tobacco that was bad. Um, but it didn't say really a whole lot of, uh, didn't really address that with a whole lot of specificity. And because the, co the federal coalition around the Moore Act has been closed to minority business organizations. And I want to be clear, that is not for my fighting, screaming, complaining, pleading. Uh, Courtney here from Marijuana Matters knows that I have gone to bat uh, several, several times in many forums. Um, but the, the activist organizations that have rallied around this didn't want to hear our voice because they don't recognize economic justice as an, a valid element of cannabis policy and cannabis reform. So we were effectively shut out of that discussion again. So, and really kept to sort of a supportive role. And, and so these amendments that happened, uh, were shared with, everybody but MCBA until hours before uh, our time to amend ran out. And, um, and so by the time we got it and were able to catch this, um, the time for that had passed. So we shifted our attention to recognizing that this bill was going to pass and we needed to ensure that what the Congress, what the members of Congress said on the floor and committed to that congressional record so that that becomes that the law that is attached to that bill um, and the message that they conveyed in public was this is this will not happen and this will not stand. And so our attention turned to that because we understood that at this point, even if we rallied all everybody and everybody, anybody and everybody, this would happen. And so yeah. our, again, our attention shifted towards protecting our members and protecting our communities to make sure there were no immediate impacts. And so, again, we ended up with something that was was ugly. And, and again, it hurts my heart because this is something, this is the day that I wanted to celebrate, um, but it puts a dampener on it. I will tell you, and I am pleased to report this, I just got off the phone with Congresswoman Lee's office and looking into the 117th Congress, Roz, you, Courtney, Eric, all of the folks that are representing minority business owners and people in this space, we have a seat at the table and we will have any and all resources that we need for our voices to be heard and any cannabis legislation that gets introduced at the federal level to reflect our needs and represent our voice. So um, I'm bruised and a little bit beaten. <laughs> uh, again, um, yeah. I, I think that it, Again, our, our focus at MCBA was uh, to eliminate the harm and the damage that could arise. Right. Um, and so, again, that, that's, that's, that's where our focus went. It wasn't the most glamorous and, and sexy and really not even the job I wanted to be doing this week. Um, but my priority was to protect our community and, and especially those who, who have had, who are really the most harmed by the war on drugs. Yeah. Bill that says they want to protect, to, to fix and right these wrongs, 
but what they did was, you know, create a potential to to actually do immediate harm. And so I, I believe that we've done an extraordinary job. And thank you to Roz and everybody else who's rallied and, and gotten together this week to support us yeah. um, in, in really seeing to it that, that there is no immediate harm. So. Yeah. You know, Amber, you really did a, a bang up job. And I and I and from my perspective, we are a community based organization. Um, we're doing work, but we as a as a founder and CEO CEO of M for MM, we can't do it all. We have to depend and work together. Absolutely. Had it not been for you, your group of uh, MCBA and your your leaders of bringing that coalition together, saying, Hey, let me let's what's going on and, and talk about it. We we've been on and Courtney's been there as well. We've been on calls back to back to back. Um, there's a variation of different, you know, some people like kill the bill and some people, you know, um, and, and knowing that you knew that there was a 50-50 chance or, you know, maybe it was more 60-40 or, or what have you, that this bill would pass. Um, do you think that the language that is there will still set a precedent or still be absorbed by the layman and by other states in regards to maybe having some type of, um, you know, uh, uh, ability to um, to lock out people that have had, you know, past convictions, our community from this industry. Do you think that still is a possibility or do you think we can rewrite the ship a little bit and, and get in there and, 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 and change um, what we see right now? Yeah. So that, again, that has been my entire focus since I saw that the train had left the station. And so um, they wouldn't have brought the vote to the floor if they didn't have the votes. The vote was narrow. So the fact that it continued, let me know that it was going to happen. Okay. And so I will tell you, and I'm telling you this as Amber Littlejohn, not executive director of MCBA. Yeah. I was angry. I was hurt. Um, I felt used. And that's just me. I can't imagine how people who this direct could, could have directly impacted felt. And so my instinct was burn it down. But yeah. I had to focus on addressing the harm. Sure. And, and had I let kind of my own personal feelings take take a hold, I wouldn't have had the opportunity to get in there, meet with Blumenauer staff, meet with Lee staff. Um, today, if you watch the hearing, the Congresswoman read on the floor a statement uh, that we that we helped to to create really. Uh, on behalf of the chairman, actually, um, that said they are committed and it is not the will and intent. And so when it and when it talks about the risk, so they're going to look when lawmakers and others take a look at this bill. They're also going to take a look at the, the congressional record, which is actually officially part of that bill. And now forever moving forward, part of that congressional record says we didn't intend this result. We are committed to protecting though and including in this industry and in, in, in equity, those who have been most impacted by prohibition, especially those who have ha had experiences with the criminal justice system around cannabis. So we have a statement on the record. We okay. have a statement coming from Lee and Blumenauer reiterating their commitment to this. And we have meetings already set to move forward in the next Congress. So to give people a little bit of reassurance, the MORE Act is now dead. The bill, the bill was voted on. It will never move in, in the Congress. And it has to start all the way over again in the 117th Congress. Yeah. So the day that that happens, the MORE Act and, or any other legislation that happens around a cannabis policy has to be reintroduced. And I assure you that when it is reintroduced, it will absolutely not be first of all not be reintroduced with any language like that but it will be introduced with the input and the representation of everybody on this phone and uh, on this call and everybody that we represent yeah uh, all of the amazing organizations hey, hey, hey. the pleasure of speaking with over the last week yes e hey amber help help yeah. people understand when you say that the the bill is dead right yeah. like some people are seeing cuz i was in um, ncia's group as they were watching it live and like people are just you know elated with the fact that this is passed and you know everybody's just excited excited thinking that this is like you know this is the, the this is the the end of the game and not just you know what i mean like a, a part of the game yeah. so help people understand when you say that the bill is done 
help people understand, uh, you know, what that kind of means and, and why you say that. Uh, I'll, I'll approach that from both the procedural and, and kind of the non-procedural angle. Uh, the bill is technically dead because every Congress, if a bill isn't passed, uh, it's got to be reintroduced again. And so yeah. we are ending the 116th Congress and we'll move into the period, what come January, <laughs> come January, where we are looking at reintroducing cannabis bills. Um, and so, and the only way that more could survive and become law is if somehow between now and the end of basically today, because next week the federal government has to try and do COVID relief, fund the military and fund the government. So they're not going to be talking about cannabis next week. Um, and then they go into recess. Um, so somehow today, Congress, the Senate would have to take it up and pass it. We all know that that's not happening. Wow. And so that means that the MORE Act is now dead. Um, and so now when or the other way that the MORE Act is dead is that this coalition was extraordinarily flawed. I will tell you uh, that I believe uh, in our core, and, and, and Roz, you can give me this, uh, when we spoke to Congressman Lee and Congressman, uh, Congresswoman Lee and Congressman Blumenauer, um, they were genuinely distraught that nobody caught this uh, earlier. Yeah. Um, because these are people that have been out there fighting for cannabis, not just legalization, but equity since long before it was cool for the rest of their their, their partners in, in the house to, to be doing so. And so I even got calls from the Ways and Means Committee in the middle of an extraordinary, extraordinarily busy period of time uh, expressing genuine, on top of the call that we had, calling me back the next day because they reflected on it and were devastated um, by this result. So I have spoken to Ways and Means is the committee that is in charge of that amendment. And again, they have expressed genuine, uh, uh, genuine uh, regret and have committed personally as a committee to give us, help us with resources and to sit down and ensure that we are at the table and yeah. that we look at everything through the lens of, of our needs and experience and, and, economic, and economic justice. So the coalition that excluded minority businesses and excluded economic justice, that is dead. So we have the opportunity now the folks here on, on this panel and the folks listening uh, to completely reshape this and not allow people to say the only the only equity is restorative justice or the only equity is freeing the plant. We can talk about economic justice right. and, and we can talk about the impact on our community. We can talk about uh, the need to economically empower our communities and really have us have a place and a say in this industry. So. As, yeah. as much as the spirit of exclusion of people of color uh, surrounds the MORE Act, that that is dead. And so yeah. I, I am pleased to be able to look look to the future with all of you and have a very different coalition and a yeah. very different set of legislation introduced in the 117. To, to that point, Courtney, I want to ask you from your experience working, you know, with legislators kind of in the behind the scenes. We all know that, you know, the folks behind the scenes are really who, you know, uh, I, I mean, they go to bat for us. They teach us. They help us. And so, you know, talk about it and, because we get a lot of people who watch our show who, you know, are not involved in the fight like Amber and Roz and myself, you know, in, in that, you know, uh, day to day but they want to know how can they get involved? Like, how can they impact this conversation? How can they let Congress know that, you know, while we're excited this conversation is going on, we're very disappointed that it's not going on with a, a lens and a focus towards our community. So, you know, give them some insight on what they could do, I guess. Okay, yeah. Um, that's a good question that a lot of folks, I, I get all the time, even when I was a staffer, um, you know, folks would, would come in and they would, you know, want to introduce themselves, uh, introduce their business to us. And they sometimes just feel like they almost don't belong. They're like, hey, we're here. I just want to tell you, here's what we're doing. Um, you know, but you, I think that those 
individuals need to understand that you really do have a role to play in policy and legislation and the and the way that things are made. Stakeholder engagement is extremely important. And I can't tell you how many times folks come into the office after something has already been printed, after a bill is getting ready to go, it's gone through the committee process, it's getting ready to go to the floor and they don't realize that they're a little bit late to the to the process for the negotiations. And so, you know, introducing yourself to your legislators is not illegal. You don't need an appointment. Um, you know, you don't have to be with an association, even though that is one of the ways that you can stay informed um, and maybe feel a little bit more comfortable about doing some outreach to your legislators. Um, but I would really encourage folks to um, look at organizations like MCBA, Marijuana Matters. Um, we're working on a number of education and advocacy tools um, to, you know, essentially armor that you can use when you're going, um, you know, to the battlefield like Amber has been all week. Um, and when you need to make your point, you know, you know, there are a lot of businesses that, I mean, members of Congress and, and state legislators and their staff, they don't know everything. They don't work in these industries. A lot of us are trained in college on political science and maybe a law degree. They know how to read law, but they don't actually work in these industries and understand the impact of language and understanding, you know, the difference between congressional intent and what's actually in the in the language. So I think that, you know, folks to just be emboldened to reach out to their legislators, reach out to your, uh, you know, your county commissioners, um, some of these state bills, um, you know, cannabis may be coming to your town and their counties are going to have to say in whether or not they want those dispensaries in their town. And so you have to really know folks at all levels of government yes. and get involved in your community. There are a lot of groups that you may not, you know, we may not get the front page of the New York Times and political, but we're here, we're doing the work. We're here to, you know, to help and serve as a resource to individuals that really are looking for ways to, to get involved. Yeah. Well, if you guys could think of things, and I'll just shoot it to you, Amber, first, and then you, Courtney, um, feel free to, to weigh in. What do you think the role is for our multi-state operators? Um, and, 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 and as we go forward in this conversation, um, and also with their time, their resources, um, their influence in, in taking up this mantle in this conversation? I will tell you, I have all kinds of roles for multi-state operators. <laughs> so if you're a multi-state operator, listen to I will tell you, I have been uh, doing okay. what I can to deploy any resources I can get to manage this. And what, what multi-state operators can do is, is step out and let us lead. Um, what they can do is is hopefully what one thing they can take away from the MORE Act is that equity will be a cornerstone of federal cannabis policy. Yeah. And, and hopefully they can take that away from the, the state fights as well. And so they need to recognize, and, and this is when I talk to the multi-state operators that might not be uh, as committed as, as others are to the idea of social equity, is for them to sit down and think about the bottom line of it, you know, caring for your community and, and being a good steward and guardian of your community has bottom line benefits. And so respecting and honoring that, because sometimes the moral argument does not compel, you know, for those companies that you can compel with the moral argument, they should be giving resources to organizations like m for mm and Marijuana Matters and elevating their message and listening and not trying to manage and control the narrative, but supporting and addressing and working with and, and educating. And I don't mean educating as in tell, telling you the way it's going to be done, but providing the resources that people need to and organizations need to advocate for themselves. Um, you know, something that you know, as an organization of, of people that are truly firm in our beliefs and our commitment and at times make unpopular decisions uh, when it comes to the MSOs, for example, um, MCBA opposed the States Act 
Um, we were the first big organization to come out in opposition to the States Act. And we took blue blowback for probably uh, close to a year um, from the consequences of that because the multi-state operators wanted it. They thought it was gonna move forward. And we just said, no, this is not good for our community. Um, it does not address any of the issues of social equity. And so you gotta be willing to make unpopular decisions. And so, um, you know, but but now we're at the point again where we're not, you know, they and, and so we're hopefully not gonna be getting there anymore and, and we're getting to a better place. And so just having the ability to, to have our voices amplified and, and have the support that we need. And, you know, going into the 117th Congress, we have a lot of really technical, unfun work to do. Yeah. tax policy, regulations, um, things that, that take a lot of resources. So I definitely implore the multi-state operators to come up off the resources. We need your tax, tax experts. We need your, um, you know, we need your regulatory experts. We need you to, to engage and to help us educate, you know, our members on, on what we should be looking for. And so, Again, it really talks, it just boils down to resources and support and respect. You know, they, they're not here. They exist because of us yes. um, and our movement. So they need to honor that and, and pay it forward. And I think the media aspect, you know, having relationships with the agencies and with the media outlet, we have to have the story and the narrative um, be able to have um, some say in that. And I want to challenge our MSOs. Um, you know, right from right and wrong from wrong. And so you don't have to wait on us to make that statement. You can make that statement of saying, this is great, but it did not, this is not good. And be very specific. Courtney, your thoughts too on this. Yeah, um, I mean, I echo everything that Amber says. Coming up off the resources is definitely something that MSOs have. You know, they have folks on retainer. And there have been some groups that, that have decided to lend out their um, you know, their consultants and their in-house counsels for several hours a month. Um, so I think for, for for organizations, they really have to kind of identify what their goals are within the community, you know, engage the community that they're a part of, um, have folks on their board that reflect individuals that are in the community or, or, or folks that they're trying to serve. Um, you know, stating that you have a social equity program that's ran by all white people from MIT. <laughs> I mean, that's that sounds good. It looks good on paper, but you know, at Marijuana Matters, we really believe that you affect change through having folks that have those center lived experiences. And so, um, you know, the stakeholder engagement at all levels of your business is going to be really important to make sure that you are operating with intent and that you're not just, um, you know, using your resources as one time fixes to right. someone, but you have no diversity and inclusion and equity program at your organization. You know, does that, is that person going to feel included in decision-making? Are there opportunities for growth? Um, you know, I also think that there are other ways that, you know, MSOs can help by, supporting brands, you know, diversifying, helping to diversify supply chains. There are a lot of folks that have good brands that maybe can't pay top shelf to be, you know, placed in your or in your store, um, you know, offering incentives and discounts for those brands to, to give them a chance to get off the ground um, yeah. is something that, you know, we need MSOs to start thinking a little bit more about people over profits. Um, which is which is something that you know corporate responsibility is essentially um, you know we live in an, a day and age where folks want to know that they're supporting a business that is doing right by a particular industry. Are you saving water? Are you sustainable for an, on the environment? Are you recycling packaging? Are you helping black and brown people? Like these are things that are good for business, um, and then are also going to be good for the. Um, communities that have been disadvantaged for so long. Roz, can I just piggyback on the end of that and give the sort of the opposite side, which is when it comes to any advocates or organizations that are out there and interfacing with MSOs, remember that these, these are dating relationships. These are not marriages. And so I encourage you all to look for even finite synergies between yourself and the priorities of the organ of the MSO. 
because yeah. you might be able to link up in this one beautiful spot where you both care about an issue or a set of priorities, and you then can work together on just that. You can get funding, you can create some programs, do some advocacy together. So again, I encourage you to look for synergies, opportunities in the synergies with MSOs and recognize that it doesn't have to be a holistic marriage of your two, you know, your two organizations, organizations but really yeah. just a, a meeting of the minds at times, because again, we are a trade association. So we have companies of all size that are involved and, you know, companies that come into MCBA do so knowing that we don't waver from our mission. And so we do the work with the MSOs that are the places that we intersect. Um, but we don't allow ourselves to deviate from our mission to accommodate anyone or even all of our, our larger members. It, well, it takes courage and strength and, um, you know, the NDRE, courage, strength and wisdom to, to step out and say, we're going to drive our mission this way. We Yes, we want to partner, but if you go this way and it does not, it's not in line with our mission, um, you're going to see some pushback. And I, and I think, um, you know, to your point, Courtney, you know, the more than a moment, e, I don't know if that kind of like when Courtney was talking about, like, you know, this past year, this past summer, you saw the proliferation of MSOs and trade organizations get on board and talk about we're going to dismantle systemic racism and we're going to do it. And and good Lord, if I saw and, and now I'm looking, I'm like, we're, we're having all of the dollars and all of the resources. And as yeah, you, they, as we all know, I mean, e, your, your thoughts, man. And, and Amber and I were on, <laughs> on a, a association call earlier this week, and I made a similar style comment about that very fact that, you know, we, we saw a lot of outpouring of messaging and we even saw some dollars come out, checks being cut, but they, for some reason, weren't being cut to the organizations that, again, have built the, the credibility in our communities who have been on the ground forward facing with our communities. And that's something that still needs to be rectified, I think, in the industry and, and so on. My question to both of you guys, to, to you ladies, um, why is it that we have to, why, why do we struggle so hard to wrap our heads around the fact that doing the work of social equity or doing the work of engaging with communities of color actually makes good business sense like why why i mean why is that such a, a missed you know i guess idea because the the black and brown dollar has never been you know uh second to any we don't other. hold it hostage we spend right. like you don't believe right what i mean it's like it, this isn't a new <laughs> phenomenon and, and I, I i struggle with understanding the thought process of large msos who really don't understand like we have buying power so even from a business standpoint, you should be, you know, trying to engage with these communities. And then you you couple in the fact that this industry was built on the backs of these communities. Like I, I just I struggle with understanding what is the disconnect there. And and I'm you know curious what you guys think about that. I'll let you start okay. I'll lead off with this. I'm sure we both have something to say to that. Okay. Um I, would, I think that the community does have buying power. I think that one of the things that has been missing is probably the, the coalition, that the power be, behind the coalition. Um, I think that we're trying to do a better job of, you know, under, of, of getting, you know, getting the narrative out about our mission, what it is that our community is asking for and demanding. I think that we've become a little, uh, as a community in the past you know, decade or so, have become a lot stronger and more unified on that front. Um, so I think that that's part of the issue. Um, you know, and, uh, and also, you know, I think for just cannabis in general, I think people were just so excited to have access to the plant that it was kind of lost on everyone, consumers included, on how to be a conscious consumer and how we should really be thinking of this as more of more than just having access to the plant. And really, let's not forget all of those individuals while we're getting high and while we're doing whatever and starting up fun, making fun gummies and stuff. Let's not forget about all those individuals that are still incarcerated. And some people, some people say, oh, well, what happens to them? It's like, I don't know, they're still in jail. Um, do you care enough to do something about that? Um, I think that, you know, 
probably just getting more strength and numbers and growing stronger. You know, we obviously need the coalition that we're trying to form. We need the type of money that's being thrown at these larger groups like the ACLU and the last prisoners projects that are led by um, probably we, yeah, people. I'm sorry, I, I, I'm sorry. I, I interrupted. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> What you said, Ronald, <laughs> they're, you know, led by great individuals. And I, you know, I love what the Kim Kardashians and what people are doing, but we need those dollars to go to organizations for people that are really centering their work in the communities, have folks on their board, executive directors or persons of color um, so that we can craft the narrative for ourselves instead of other folks doing it for us. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. Eric, I, I'm not gonna let I'm I'm not letting them off the hook because <laughs> I actually don't think it's a matter of not knowing. I think it's an absolute matter of choice. And the decisions that large operators make around equity are a matter of economic and, and just business ideological choice. There is enough information out there generally, there is enough information out there from their competitors from our organizations, just real data um, to support the bottom line value of engaging our communities of social equity, of corporate social responsibility. And it boils, boils down to a choice. Some companies put protectionism and monopolies ahead of all things. And so they can't talk about equity if they wanna create monopolies. They yeah. can't talk about equity if they wanna shut people of color out of the industry. So it's a choice because they can't start the discussion and then be inconsistent so they can stick their fingers in their ears and pretend it won't work. It is my desire to see that the companies that take that approach fail and do not just do not succeed. And yeah. we are pleased to work with the companies that have given meaning, show meaningful commitment, both in their hiring and their practices and their commitments to organizations like ours to actually doing the work and being willing to listen. The people that will listen when I pick up the phone and say, hey, there's a problem with this yeah. and I need your big giant MSO resources to fix it. And, and so those are the people again, who I hope that we as consumers um, are supporting. Yeah, because you don't have to, you don't have to know it all. I mean, you, you have these MSOs, like literally, we're not asking for you, for you to basically um, you don't have to try to carry it all at one time, but show quantifiable movement towards uh, making change within your organization. And, and we can see it. Um, there's some that we can call out. Um, there's a shout out. You know, we've seen some MSOs that really have some great things on the horizon. There's some things they're doing. But after you get past the multi-state operators, then you come to the mid-level um, state-specific operators who have multiple locations in the state. You're not off the hook either. Because if you're in Missouri and you have four locations in Missouri, please know that your ability um, to even do more is possible because you're in a state and you control it and the economy of scales gives you the opportunity to do more and to be able to look at everything from hiring to um, supplier contracting to workforce development um, to executive positions. And so that's what we're, we're, what we're pushing for and, and want to make sure it happens. Um, I got a couple of folks on here that got some questions. Um, you guys... Um, I got here, 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 this is one. Bobby Bell says, when will it become law? Again, Amber, tell them again why it will not become law. Never. <laughs> that, that. The answer to that question is never. That flawed piece of legislation died about an hour ago. Uh, the last, the last life of the Moore Act as it existed today, uh, it's, it's deceased. Uh, it, it died upon passage. Uh, the Senate will never take it up and vote in it. It has died. It will not be raised as is in the 117th Congress. And again, we've received a commitment uh, from its proponents that not only will it not be raised with provisions that can harm us, but it will be raised with our voice reflected in that legislation. So, Gerald, just to answer your question, will it have to go to another part of the government to be voted on? There is Congress has sessions, and you have in your, you were you were doing the 116th Congress that happened um, that is coming to a close because we're coming to the end of the year. Um, the bill, as you see it, will um, not be presented. You will have a new bill. What happens is if, it's just like if you are in um, in in law, 
You want to have past precedent. You want to show the ability that lawmakers can come together and agree on a certain subject or issue that then gives you momentum to build upon that language and upon all of what you've already built, but make it better and put it into a position or um, document it and make it uh, uh, make it available to be voted on in a better um, language and draft it better to, to take make sure it's, it's caring for and supporting all of our issues and not just the large trade organizations. God bless you guys as well. Um, but the little guys also want to make sure that those issues are being addressed that we see from a community perspective. Uh, lightning round real quick. Amber. Go for it. Uh, 117th Congress. Do we get federal legalization? Yes or no? No. <laughs> Courtney, do All we right. get federal legalization in 117th no. Congress? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. well, we are hopeful for banking. I have my fingers crossed for banking that and we start our community can get some access to capital. Uh, that's that's about all I could I would say yes to at this point. Yeah. yeah I think we have a lot of work to do before we just go out and legalize cannabis. Like that would be very problematic for states that no, yeah. not right. <laughs> okay. and, and, so, and so let me ask you this, because I know we're running out of time too, but uh, we always, this is such an important conversation. So since we don't anticipate, and I kind of, you know, I'm on the same side with you guys. I didn't think it was going to be happening next year either. Um, but with that in mind, where does that leave us and our communities in the interim? Go ahead, Courtney. Um, I think that we still, there's still a lot of work to be done at the local and state levels. There are a number of states that passed ballot initiatives in November. Um, these social equity programs that states have implemented are, are flawed, um, do not have proven success rates, but we are not giving up on, you know, trying to find economic justice within the cannabis industry. And so I think that, you know, on one front, yes, we are lobbying and advocating at the federal level, but there are, are a lot of states that already have programs that have already legalized. Um, and even some of the Western states that have had, that have had adult use programs for a couple of years now and are looking to find ways to create equity in these programs. We could be there um, advocating on behalf of individuals from those communities that need help um, in order to participate in the industry and also thinking about, you know, expanding the scope to include ancillary opportunities. I know we talk a lot about licensing for cultivation, retail, um, processing, but look at the skills that you currently have. Um, you know, we're going to need folks that are in advertising, packaging, transportation. Um, these are all jobs that are going to be a part of a, an industry that will, you know, essentially and at one point will be just like any other industry, you yeah. know, in America or globally, really. Well, one thing, oh, I will tell you this, one thing that um, I thought was kind of promising with the MORE Act from, a, if, if you go and take out individual areas, was the Bureau of Labor Statistics is going to be able to report data on ownership as well as employment. And so for those folks that think it's going to be a, like right now, no matter, you know, larger companies may look at it, but some of the smaller companies, if you are, you're going to have to report your data on your employment practices and who you're hiring and how, and you're going to have to make concerted efforts to make sure that you have a diverse workforce. So, I mean, or you don't have to, but you will have a report showing that, you know, your um, your position is not a good one. So I thought that was a great piece in there um, to consider. I don't want people to think I'm being entirely bleak about what our prospects in the 117th, yeah. because we have a shift. We have a new administration and a vice president who cares greatly about this injustice. And so the protections that we lost under president, uh, under, sorry, I don't even like, excuse me for even calling him that, that guy, um, the protections that we lost under this administration right now, um, we can we can get back and then some uh, on the administrative side. So when it comes to the Department of Justice, going after small and minority owned businesses in the state of California, yeah. um, 
and all of the other, and really respecting the rights of states to have these programs and let them exist, we have that opportunity. So it's about putting pressure on the administration and calling for them to do what they can um, to fix this. Uh, we are working uh, at MCBA with some of our, our partners, uh, both in the kind of DC think tank arena and, and in industry to come up with the data and information and studies that we need ahead of even the government so that we can change and compel laws um, with that kind of data. So uh, there is a lot that we can do to affect change that while we are waiting, because the last thing that we wanna do is end up with something like what happened, what got voted on today becoming the law and us being left out. And we have to be cautious about the incremental change that we're willing to accept um, and make sure that whatever change we make incrementally, um, one, includes us as, and is in our best interest as a community and that it doesn't create a situation where it provides <laughs> unfair advantages to those who then lose incentive to keep fighting for, for equity. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let me uh, take it's a process of progress. Folks. It's a process of progress. Stay, and... stay with us, get engaged and, and you know, <laughs> uh, join the movement because we, we gotta, we gotta lock in to make sure that this comes out uh, the way it needs to for our communities. So you guys, you, you, to get in contact with um, Minority Cannabis um, Business Association, they're on IG, they're on Facebook. I just gave you the IG because IG is so quick and, and so popular, what have you. Um, Amber, just great job in the work you're doing, the leadership. Yeah. Um, you look beautiful. You've been working your tail off. Um, and shout out to again to your to your board and to your, your executive team um, for just really surrounding you. I felt... I was on that call and I felt the support. I felt the, you know, kind of, even if you, everybody ain't on the same page, it was like, what, what do we got to do? How do we support Amber? And um, just kudos yeah. for the work that you're doing. And, oh, and, keep thank you. and, and know that M4MM, um, we're committed to being and playing whatever role that we can to support and make some great things happen. Courtney, St. Sister, man, I'm so glad to just finally connect with you, um, getting you on the show. Shout out to to Marijuana Matters. Um, you guys, Marijuana Matters on IG. Um, Courtney, one last thought you want to leave with everybody? Um, sure. Um, you know, I guess just in the vein of, you know, what we talked about in the beginning of really just trying to continue to lift folks' spirits. Um, you know, I do think that we, you know, that today is a historic day. We were able to make progress. Um, but, you know, this is an industry and, you know, making policy is not for the faint of heart. This is a long game. And we would ask folks to stay committed, you know, stay informed, um, support organizations like M4MM, MCBA, uh, Marijuana Matters. Um, and we're, you know, hoping to be a resource um, in the future. Uh, absolutely. Shout out to, you know, Supernova Women, Cannabis Cultural Association. If I don't call your name, don't hold it against me. I love all of you guys, but, you know, Hood Incubator and all these folks that we've been seeing behind the scenes working, giving in. Um, shout out to the, the cannabis cup, the regulators of color who are out there, who are joining up, um, partnering together to give input. And shout out to, you know, Gia Marone, my sister. I know you're li looking and listening. I love you, man. <laughs> um, GMO Communication. If you want a good communication company, you better call Gia Marone. Ooh. That girl, she is bad. But Ooh. anyway, that's just my personal opinion. I love her. I love you guys. E, take us home, brother. Yeah, absolutely, man. Uh, this has been phenomenal. It, it was hot off the press, so I think this was just a perfect conversation for today. Uh, you ladies are absolutely amazing and phenomenal. I had the pleasure of uh, you know connecting or listening in on Courtney earlier this week on Clubhouse, Roz. I keep telling you, go check I out know, Clubhouse. I know. Uh, this weekend, let me get on. I'm getting on. I'm getting <laughs> on. Check out Clubhouse. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, you know, thank you ladies again for coming and just, you know, really sharing uh, this insight and information with the community. Uh, people really do listen and they go. I saw someone taking notes earlier. So we appreciate you all so, so, so much. And we appreciate our audience. You guys come back week after week uh, to listen, to learn, uh, and then to go and, and act on it. So we thank you, thank you, thank you for always being there for us. Remember, even after this video is over, go and share it with your family and your friends. We need more people in our communities understanding and listening to the conversations that are really happening uh, on a national level 
and at the state level, but impact us on, on a local level as well. So uh, get involved and, and pay attention. As always, this weekend, love on yourself, love on your family, get some rest, because uh, one day we got work to do, so we got to hit the ground running. This has been another episode of Canada Talk with Roz. We thank you all again. We love y'all, and we'll see y'all again next week. Hey, have a great one, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you, panel. We love you guys. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. And